OK. OK. So uh, I was saying that uh, uh, in order to calculate the density operator, since it's a function of the Hamiltonian, we can use the spectral decomposition of the Hamiltonian, which is this one, because I have taken the spectral decomposition of IZ and multiply by omega. And so the, any function of H should have the same uh, expect, spectral decomposition except for putting here, well, these functions of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, yeah, as we have seen in several cases. Uh, so this is the spectral decomposition of the density operator, which in fact could be directly written by taking into account that Boltzmann law give us the populations of the states. In this case, the, there are only two spin states, and the population at equilibrium is given by Boltzmann law, 1 over zeta, the partition functions, exponential of minus the energy divided by kT. So, in fact, it's easier to write directly the density operator by using the definition of the density operator, sum of populations times projector on projectors onto the pure states that form the mixture. Okay? Well, then we are asked to calculate the expected values of the components of the angular momentum, the Cartesian components, which is, as usual, the trace of the operator times the density operator. By substituting the, the expression we have obtained for density operator, and by taking into account that the trace of an operator times a projector can be uh, it's equal to what we obtain by formally putting this here. That is, uh, it is the in fact the expected value of the operator in the state corresponding to the projector. Mm -hmm. But to calculate expected values of i x, the easiest way is to put it in terms of ladder operators. Mm -hmm. 1 over 2, the rising operator and the lowering operator. The rising operator applied to alpha is 0. There are no more steps in the ladder. And the lowering operator applied to alpha is h power beta. And since we have here to multiply scalarly by alpha, the result is zero. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Uh, ah, yeah, OK. <laughs> I have here zero. OK, then this term, same thing. Exactly the same thing. And we can also then see that the expected value of ix is zero. Mm -hmm. Same thing for i y. Mm -hmm. We put i y in terms of ladder operators, and then uh, completely parallel reasoning uh, shows that the expected value is zero. And for i z, for i z, we we express the trace in terms by putting the spectral decomposition of rho. And here, we obtain that this is non-zero because alpha is an eigenvalue of iz, same thing here. So this gives the corresponding eigenvalues. And, and then, 
since zeta is the sum of the exponentials and in the numerator we have the difference of the exponentials I have taken this factor outside the quotient then we have the sum, this difference divided by this sum which is nothing but the hyperbolic tangent of the argument eh, we have here. Mm -hmm. You know that hyperbolic functions uh, have a quite parallel definition to the, to the three onomatic functions except that the exponential the exponentials are real instead of imaginary. Eh? But there is a, a parallelism between the definition of the sinus, the cosinus, and the tangent, uh, mm, the normal ones, and the uh, hyperbolic ones. Eh? Well, this is only a way to write it in a more compact form. Okay? Then, next. Uh, yeah. Then we are going to use real data for the gamma of carbon 13, the a typical field in NMR of 10 Tesla, a typical temperature, in order to see that this term, this quotient, is very small uh, as compared to unity. And so these exponentials can be expanded and we can retain only uh, the two first terms of the Taylor expansion of the exponential. Uh, the exponential, the Taylor expansion of the exponential is very simple. One exponential of x is one plus x plus x squared, etc. Well, let's, let's check it. Uh, this is gamma, this is the, the field. Yeah, re recall that omega was gamma B0. Well, in fact, this is the absolute value of omega. Yeah? Uh, we, are, we want only to obtain a, an order of magnitude. Then we substitute and we obtain 8 multiplied by 10 to minus 6. So it's clear that this is a small term yeah? and uh, put in an uh, exponential, the Taylor expansion converges very quickly. Um, this is called sometimes the high temperature limit. It's funny because in what we got NMR, even a temperature of one Kelvin is a high temperature limit <laughs> because if instead of 300, ah, okay, instead of this temperature, we put one Kelvin and we obtain something times 10 to minus 4. So even in that case, the, the quotient here is very small and we can consider that we are in a high temperature limit. So in almost every case, we can we can uh, expand the exponentials and retain only the first two terms. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we do it here, yeah, this exponential gives this result. The, this is the negative, the positive exponential. Then the two ones cancel, and in the quotient, these two terms. In the denominator, these two terms cancel, and we obtain this simple result. We obtain that the z component of the angular momentum is inversely proportional to the absolute temperature. Uh, the magnetization, the magnetization is a macroscopic quantity, which is in fact the magnetic moment per unit volume and um, um, it is of course related to this quantity yeah? because if we multiply this quantity by the number of nuclei and by, by the 
geomagnetic ratio that transform angular momenta into, di into magnetic momenta, then we obtain a similar relationship in which, of course, we retain the inverse proportionality with the temperature, and that was empirically discovered by uh, Curie, and is called the uh, Curie law. Mm -hmm. Well, so we have justified the Curie law. Let's see what's after. OK, use, use the high temperature approximation to write the density operator in that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, show how does this operator evolve with time. Let's go. Well, um, this was the spectral decomposition in which I have substituted the exponentials by the expansion, the Taylor expansions. And then this with this and with the one half is the identity operator. It's a resolution of the identity. And this with this, if we write it that way, here we take the h bar over 2 here and here, we see that this is the spectral decomposition of iz. I can value times projector, I can value times projector. And so we can see that with a very good approximation, we can write the density operator this way. How does this operator evolve with time? Well, in general, this is the evolution. This is one way of writing the evolution of the density operator. And the time evolution operator, since it's a conservative system, the Hamiltonian is time independent, we saw that it's it's trivial to write the time evolution operator in terms of the Hamiltonian. It's e to minus Hamiltonian divided by h bar and multiplied by t. This is the Hamiltonian. And uh, since this is a function of iz, and this is a function also of iz, two functions of the same operator commute and so this operator can be put here, and then we have the negative exponential times the positive exponential. This is the product of one, in fact, it's a unitary operator multiplied by its, its inverse and its unity, and so we see that there is no time evolution. Of course, this result should be expected because we have already seen that at equilibrium, the density operator never evolves. So this is only to check that everything is consistent. OK. And then, uh, OK, here, OK. Now we have a radio frequency pulse. By applying the time dependent Schrodinger equation, we can see how does the system evolve, the density operator evolve, when we apply a, a 90 degrees pulse over the i-axis? Well, um, this is somewhat more involved. I give you the result. Yeah? When we apply the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, we obtain that this pulse changes the density operator to this one. is very similar except for instead of iz, here we have ix. So in fact, the, the effect of a pulse is the same as in classical mechanics. Uh, uh, in classical mechanics, it, it can be seen that by if we have a magnetic moment pointing to the z-axis, and then we apply a pulse 
in which the magnetic field is pointing to the I axis, in ca it can be seen. Uh, well, let me see. Yeah, then it can be seen that this magnetic moment turns around this axis and by giving a precise mm, duration of the poles, duration, <laughs> uh, by, by, by taking a precisely uh, time for the poles, then we can make that uh, the, the turn is of angle pi over 2, and that's called uh, pi over 2 pulse. Eh? So, by, by using the precise time uh, or duration of the pulse, we can make the magnetization turn around the y-axis by 90 degrees. And same happens in quantum mechanics, except for the only difference is that we have to use expected values of the magnetic moment instead of the corresponding classical properties. Well, so we have given a pulse, and then we have the density operator. The new density operator is this one. How this evolves with time? We're going to see that this is no longer, this no longer corresponds to an equilibrium situation. And then we will calculate again the magnetic components, the, no, the angular momentum components around the axis to see what happens after the poles. Okay? <coughs> well, this is, uh, this is the density operator after the poles. And then the, we apply the time evolution operator to see how does this operator evolve with time. Yeah, we, we are using again this expression. Mm -hmm. Then the unit operators always commute with every other operator. So when we multiply by the unit operator, this and this uh, give unity, and then we obtain again the unity operator. Yeah, we can say that the unity operator never evolves with time, because when we put it here, then this time this is unity, so there is no evolution of this part of rho. What about this part? Okay, we apply the exponential operators in both sides, and we use a hint that is in the statement of the exercise that tells us that the product of this times this times this is this. Hmm. This can be verified by Taylor expanding the functions at either side of the equation. It is it's not difficult to verify this relation. And then we have the expression of the density operator at any time after the poles. What does this represent physically? So we are going to calculate again the components of the angular momentum. X component. To raise, as usual. And then we have to we use this expression and we multiply here and here by ix hmm? and take the trace well let's consider first this term the trace of this product is the sum of the diagonal elements in an orthonormal basis set we take the usual alpha beta basis set. And then since Ix is self-adjoint, we can put it in the right-hand side and we obtain this. And then, as usual, 
we put IX in terms of ladder operators and same for IY. Uh, well, as usual, A plus applied to alpha gives zero. A minus applied to alpha gives beta times H bar and a two dividing here. Well, similar thing here. We obtain that these two terms are opposite, so the result is zero. Mm -hmm. Trace of ix squared. There is a very simple way to calculate this trace because this operator, when applied to alpha, it's clear that this uh, we have to apply two times ix uh, no sorry iz applied to alpha two times gives h bar square over four times alpha and same for beta the iz eigenvalue is negative, but, but since we have here the square, we obtain the same result. And so we can, we can write iz square as h bar over 4 times the unit operator. Any operator having all the eigenvalues equal is proportional to the unit operator. It's nothing by the unit operator multiplied by the eigenvalue. And of course, there is nothing special with SZ. The same should happen to any other component of uh, the angular momentum. For instance, if we calculate this trace well, if we apply this operator to, in fact, I, I could have written the same thing, but using, using the states plus or minus, which are, of course, also a basis said eh, the same thing for minus and so this operator also is proportional to the unity operator eh? and the trace of the unity operator what is the trace of the unity operator the trace of the unity operator is always the dimension of the space because it's a sum of as many ones of the dimension of the space so in this case it's two yeah. So, this is the trace of this times the trace of 1, which is 2, and we have obtained the trace. Yeah. Well, of course, you can also proceed in this way, yeah, in the standard way of calculating the trace of the sum of the diagonal matrix elements, and then we reach the same conclusion. But, well, it's, it's Interesting to recall that when an operator has all the eigenvalues equal, it's a very simple, trivial operator. Mm -hmm. Well, so at the end, we let me let me raise. <clears throat> well, then we obtain that the expected value is, uh, let me see, is this, which is, no, this is zero. Eh? We have calculated this, we multiply by this, so we obtain this result. Okay? Well, in a completely similar way, we can obtain the trace of the y component and 
the trace of the Z component is zero, um, let me see. Okay, we can make a similar calculation. This should be rather trivial. Uh, Z component, yeah, in the Z component case, we have to multiply it here by IZ, IZ, so we have two products that are this type, and then the trace should be zero. Mm -hmm. So, what we obtain is that in the X, Y, plane, at time zero, the magnetic moment is pointed into the x-axis. And then it turns with angular speed omega into, in an anti-clockwise sense, if omega is positive. Hmm. Well, no. no. X, well, in fact, at the, well, no. In fact, we have a negative sign here. Yeah? We'll start here, and then uh, this, as time evolves, a negative component of the I, of the Y component appears. So we have the same result, but, but starting here. Yeah. We, the magnetic moment, turns around the z-axis. This, this is the typical precession motion around the magnetic field. So at equilibrium, the magnetization points to the magnetic field, but after the poles, the, magnetis the magnetization is brought to the z-axis. And it uh, evolves. Uh, first, we have the magnetization here, z-axis. The pulse brings the magnetization to the x-axis. And then it turns around the x-y plane. OK? In fact, this, this, this produces um, an electromagnetic signal, this is like an antenna emitting signals, and this signal is, is detected, and this is the way of detecting that there has been a spin that has, has changed with the pulse. Yes, I have a question here. Um, here, the, the density operator, let me see, well, this is the density operator. This is, oh, no, <laughs> the density operator is here. This operator is has here a component ix and um, of course the the in this case in this case we have in fact we have not a well defined uh, value for any component eh? because in fact we are in a mixed state yeah? but um, iz is well defined in the alpha or the beta states. But, but here we have no alpha nor beta states. We have a mixture of alpha and beta. And uh, well, no. In this case, in this case, we have a mixture of alpha and beta. And and uh, let me see. 
Well, and here we have a non-vanishing value of IZ. Hmm? But here, well, in fact, we, we should put this in terms of alpha and beta to see, maybe we could see uh, how this um, expected value is non-zero or is zero. Yeah, probably if we write this operator in the, as a matrix, for instance, if we look the, at the matrix representation in the alpha beta um, basis set, we should obtain here a value and the negative corresponding value. And so in this state, we have the probability of obtaining alpha and the probability well, no, 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 <laughs> uh, no, no, probabilities cannot be negative, let me see. Yeah, we should obtain the same, the same element here and here, if we use the alpha and beta basis set. And then we have the same probability of obtaining alpha and obtaining beta when we measure IZ. And so this explains that the expected value is zero. Well, yeah, I think um, we can, you and me <laughs> can think about it for the next day. We can try to express this operator to obtain the matrix representation in terms of the basis set alpha beta. And we should obtain the same value, the same two values in the diagonal. Um, we, you will see that the matrix is non-diagonal. Yeah, there are elements here and here. Yeah, because um, this, uh, uh, this operator has uh, what, we, what is called coherences. When a matrix representation has non-diagonal element, the interpretation of those elements is uh, quite subtle. <laughs> they are called coherences. I think I gave you a paper in which I discussed this in detail. But the diagonal elements, again, can be considered as populations of the corresponding states, probabilities of obtaining the corresponding eigenvalues when measuring the property with eigenstates, eigen alpha and beta. And so if this is zero, I'm sure that these two probabilities must be the same. OK? You can try to check it. OK? So let's go on. <coughs> yeah. Well, this is uh, very simple. Eh? It's to write the operators for the components of the spin angular momentum in terms in the Schrodinger picture, in the time evolution picture of Schrodinger eh? for this state, the state we have considered in the previous exercise, eh? a pure state, which is an eigenstate of Sx. Eh? Well, and we again should use a relationship between these exponential operators and these uh, trigonometric functions. Uh, let's have a look, quick look. Um, well, mm, the change from the Schrodinger representation to the Heisenberg representation was given by the time evolution operator. Then, um, we apply the relationship that we are given in the statement and we obtain this result. The same for the Y component and for the Z component. Yeah. This, well, this one of these relationships was in the previous exercise, one of the two, I don't remember which. And finally, for Z, 
the result is trivial because this is a, com a function of iz, so it should commute with iz, and then we can put it on the left hand side and we have the unity. This is the unity operator. Okay? Of course, we could reach the same result by looking at the fact that this is a constant of motion and we know that constants of motion are time independent in the Rodinger equation, in the Heisenberg picture, and then of course this should be time independent. It should have the same value as in the origin of time. Okay? And um, if we calculate the expected values of the angular momentum components, we must obtain, of course, the same result as in the Rodinger equation. Expected values should not depend on the time evolution picture we use for calculating. Here, the state is constant, but the operator is time is dependent. And so we have two terms, this and this. And again, we can write ix in terms of ladder operators, make the products, etc., etc. And you can check it out. It's very simple to see that we obtain the cosinus, the sinus, and zero as in the as we obtain also in the regular picture. The difference is that here, the operators itself uh, themselves are changing with time as if they were uh, classical vectors. Okay? Well, <coughs> let me see. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I told you to look at this exercise. Let, let's have a look. Here we have a problem which is very connected to elect electronic functions. We have a couple of particles in a singlet state. They, that could be electrons in general, uh, any two particles with spin one half. Mm? And we consider this pure state, yeah, which is the what we call the singlet state. Yeah, it's called singlet because this is an eigenstate of S square with eigenvalue zero. So it's an eigenstate corresponding to the quantum number S0. After the particles, we have these particles that separate without interacting with any other system, and we measure S, Z in the first one and obtain this result. In which state is left the second particle? Let's see what happens to the okay this is the initial state then we measure as z and obtain one over two in atomic units and what's the state vector after the measurement for pure states we saw that the effect of the measurement is to project onto the eigenspace corresponding to the obtained eigenvalue. So this projector. In this case, is a, is a projector onto a unidimensional space because there's only one vector with eigenvalue uh, one half. This is the projector. We multiply by the projector the previous state vector, and this is alpha times alpha unity, this is alpha times beta 
zero, and so this term vanishes, and then we are left with alpha and beta, and some factors that, of course, after normalizing, this factor should disappear because we know that this is a normalized uh, ket of the two-particle Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this is a non-entangled state because it's a product of two states for the two particles, but the first state was entangled because if the measurement gives one half, the final state is this one. But if the result of the measurement were minus one half by making exactly the same calculation, then this is the surviving term. This term should give zero if we put beta and beta in the projector. And then the final state, even for particle two, depends on the result obtained in the measurement of particle one, no matter the distance between them. And this is, in fact, what we call entanglement. And so we verify that the, the initial state is an entangled state. Uh, here we consider a component of the triplet state. The triplet state is the state, the eigenstate of S square with eigenvalue 2. S, oh yeah, S equal 1, then the eigenvalue is S times S plus 1, so this is 2. Uh, do you know that this is a triply degenerate state with respect to S square, and three eigenstates can be chosen as alpha alpha, beta beta, and alpha beta plus beta alpha. Eh? In particular, well, this should be normalized. Work. We first consider the alpha alpha case. What happens if we measure SZ on particle one and we obtain one in half? Now we apply the projector and well, uh, now it's very trivial to see that the, in fact, this is an eigenstate of SZ. And we know that if we have the system in an eigenstate of the operator corresponding to the property we are measuring, then there is no change in the state caused by the measurement. And so, after the measurement, we can check by applying the projector that this state is not changed. So, there is no effect that transmits instantaneously from one particle to the other, because, in fact, particle two is in the same state as was uh, before the measurement. There is no change in the state of particle two upon the measurement made on particle one. So this is, there is no signs of entanglement. Of course, well, I am analyzing one of the possible properties of the system. <laughs> and maybe we should analyze any other property to verify that there can be no effect upon the measurement of one of the particles, but uh, we already know that, in fact, when the, the state vector is a product of state vectors for the two particles, the state is non-entangled state. Mm -hmm. And, of course, for, the, for this component of the triplet, again, we have entanglement because, in fact, we have the same state vector as in the singlet case, except for a change of sign, and then we can follow the same reasoning and reach the same conclusions. Yeah? So, in the triplet, this is an entangled state, 
those are non entangled states. Okay? Uh, well, too past, let's make a break here, and in 10 minutes we continue. <laughs> Hello, hello again. Um, let's let's comment one moment about the question a student has made me here in Barcelona. Um, it's an interesting question. In the three components of a triplet state, we have uh, alpha beta plus beta alpha. then alpha, alpha, and beta, beta. In those two states, it's clear that the modulus of the angular momentum, uh, well, at, at least is rather intuitive that if the two spins are parallel, they will give a non-vanishing modulus, eh, which uh, is uh, if the z components are one half, then the resulting uh, spin, total spin, should have the value, the z component 1, so everything is quite co coherent. And same for beta, beta. But in this case, the state vector is very similar to the vector of the singlet state, and it is now evident how, if the two spins are opposite, why we say that we are in a singlet state, in, in a triplet state, because a triplet state, we say the two spins are parallel, and in the singlet state, they are anti parallel. In this case, it's not evident. But it is not evident if we look only at SZ, because they are not parallel, they are in fact anti parallel. The, as respect to the, et, to the ZX, eh, their Z components are anti-parallel. And so we should look to other components to understand why this can be a triplet state. And that's what we are going to do in the next exercise. I put it just to, to have a deeper uh, intuitive representation of what uh, a triplet state. Eh? In fact, there is a very simple way of, by using classical vectors, eh, to, to interpret how this could, could happen. In the singlet state, we could say, okay, the two spins are completely anti-parallel, and of course, the Z components are opposite. In alpha-alpha uh, state, the two spins could be, for instance, like this, eh, and then the result is along the positive z axis. And well, this is not very <laughs> very accurate because, in fact, the direction of the spin in a triplet is makes also some angle. But it's clear that if they are parallel, the result should be non-negative. And in this case we could imagine something like this, in which the two spins are opposite as we regards the Z component, but has the same direction in a plane perpendicular to the Z axis, and so the result can be non-zero. Well, this is not very accurate, so, we're, so we are going to study this problem with more detail. And that's what we will do in the next exercise. Ah, sorry, we had more questions here. Let me see. B, C. Okay, answer the same questions as in, well, this, this is very, answer the same questions as in A for the triplet state. Yeah, of course, the treatment of the singlet and this component of the triplet is completely parallel, so I won't enter into many details. 
Uh, this is the triplet component. Uh, the triplet component corresponding to M, uh, M uh, I zero, no, M S, we are speaking of electrons. Uh, exactly the same as in A. Eh? The change of sign don't affect the deduction, as you could see. Mm -hmm. Then, next question. Um, what do we know? Yeah, what do we know about SZ1, SZ2, and the product of both? That's what is called a joint observable, an observable that implies both particles. And of course, this informs about the relative orientation of the two components. This is positive if they are parallel, negative if they are anti-parallel. I refers to the Z components, of course. Uh, what can we say about those observables in the three states in the state constituents in A, B, and C? And also in a mixture state, which is 0.5 the singlet and 0.5 probability for the triplet, for the M0 component of the triplet. Hmm? Well, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, in the singlet and the zero component of the triplet, we have no information about SZ1 or SZ2. Hmm? Uh, well, this is, in fact, if we go back, we you can see that the probabilities, well, the probabilities of obtaining plus or minus one half are both equal to 0.5 and so this means that we have no idea both possible results are uh, equal equally probable yeah? so the result is completely random but the state vector is an eigenstate of the product of these two components with eigenvalue minus 1 over 4, yeah? because we have that when, when we apply this to operator to each term, we apply it here and we obtain minus 1 over 4 times the same thing, same thing here. So this is a linear combination of eigenstates of this joint observable. Okay? So, we, we should say, we have no idea of the Z component of those two particles. But we are sure that they are antiparallel. If we measure one of them and obtain positive value, the other one should be negative and vice versa. Yeah? So that's the physical picture of the state. We we could think of two particles which are always anti-parallel, but they are rotating in the space, and so the, 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 the individual components are not predictable, but the product of them is. Well, I have verified it here. Eh? I can value times function. Well, same thing for this mixture state, because this is a mixture of two states that are identical in what respects to SZ. The conclusions we have obtained here are exactly the same for these two states. So if we have a mixture of two pure states which has which have completely undetermined individual SZ components, but completely determinate product of them, 
corresponding to anti-parallel components, the same thing should apply to the mixture. Yeah, because in fact we have probability, this probability of having this state and this probability of having this state. Mm -hmm. Well, um, here I have written some notes. Let me see what was. Uh, yeah, the three states, in fact, have the same information about these three observable. So, why this is a mixture state and these are pure states? Of course, because there should be other observables that are determinant here, but non-determinant here. So, this will be the object of the next exercise. In particular, uh, in fact, you already know that the singlet and triplet states are eigenstates of S square. But S square here is indeterminate because if we measure it, we have 50% of probability of obtaining the result zero, 50% of probability of obtaining the result two, eh, corresponding to S equal one. Mm -hmm. So we see that, uh, we see here a clear difference that shows that we have less information in the mixture state than in the pure states. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So let's go to the next exercise in which again to, we are considering the same thing the same singlet and triplet states of a couple of spin one half particles. And now we are going to analyze another property. We are going to see what happens with Sx. First, we are asked to show that this triplet component can be put in terms of eigenstates of Sx in this way, yeah, where we already know, our, no, uh, this expression for the triplet state and this expression for the singlet state. Yeah? And uh, the eigenstates of Sx, yeah, we have already seen that are the sum and the difference of the eigenstates of S, Z. Well, and then we ask, we ask the same thing as in the previous exercise, but now refer, uh, refer to the X components instead of the um, Z components. Let's go. Uh, well, we can consider simultaneously both cases because the only thing that changes is the sign. I won't write the labels of the particles because we normally use the convention that the first state refers to particle one and the second state refers to particle two. So this is the <clears throat> the eigenstates of Sx, yeah? and uh, instead of putting plus and minus, I have put P and M, yeah? because if not, we can have, there can be mistakes with the symbols of the operations, so we call P and M the eigenstates of Sx. Yeah? By adding and subtracting this two equation, we can put alpha and beta in terms of them, in terms of P and M, and then we introduce it, these expansions of alpha and beta, beta and alpha, we make the products, <coughs> but there was a one half here that comes from these two normalization constants. And then 
Well, we can simplify several terms and we we'll finally obtain this result. This for the triplet and similar thing for the singlet. Mm, the result is different. Eh? Here we have PP minus MM, here we have PM minus MP minus PM. Hmm? Well, so in this state now it's very easy what happens when we measure the X components. For instance, in the well, in both of them, if we measure the X component of say particle one, the probability, for instance here, the probability of obtaining a positive value is the square of this coefficient and the probability of obtaining minus negative value is the square of minus the coefficient which is exactly the same, one over two. Eh? And same, he, same thing here, eh? uh, the probability of this function gives, the coefficient of this function gives the probability of obtaining as x equal one, well this is minus, so this is the probability of obtaining this value and this, the coefficient of this term gives the probability of obtaining the positive value and both again are 1 over 2. Yeah? So here, here we have no idea of the x components. Mm -hmm. But the product of them is 1 over 4 with complete certainty. Yeah? Because in, in the, if we calculate the probability of obtaining, let me see, well, in fact, yeah, the probability of obtaining, oh, let me see, let me see, the probability of obtaining 1 over 4 here is the square of this coefficient plus the square of this coefficient because both terms are eigenstates of this operator with eigenvalue 1 over 4. And so the probability of obtaining this value is 1. Mm -hmm. And for the for the singlet, let me see. Mm -mm -mm. I think uh, there is a mistake here because here this is an eigenstate of S plus, no, S x1, S x2 with eigenvalue, yeah, the eigenvalue in this case is 1 over 4. But here, since 1 is plus and the other is minus, the eigenvalue is minus 1 over 4. And so, this is true only, this is true for the triplet and uh, for the singlet, we should always obtain the negative result. Yeah, there is, this is, this is wrong, this is, this only applies to the triplet. And in fact, it, it's in, accordance to the to the intuitive interpretation we have given before. In the triplet, the X components are parallel. In the singlet, the X components are anti-parallel. So the 
anti-parallelism of the spins for this state should be um, is clearly seen by looking at the x components, not at the z components. Okay. Well, I will correct this and give the corrected version. Okay. Well, any question? I <laughs> always forget to ask for questions. Hmm? Well, I hope in Madrid you can also <laughs> make questions, even if we have very little free time. <clears throat> and uh, well, there was there were more questions. Let me see. Uh, okay, we have to to look at these observables for the three states. Let me... This we have seen. Okay. For the alpha-alpha state, for instance, if we want to study Sx, it's better to put it in terms of SS, Sx eigenstates and then we obtain this result. And here, the probability of obtaining plus or minus when measuring the x component of particle 1 and the probability of obtaining plus or minus for particle 2 uh, are both the same. Yeah? Because there are 2 plus and 2 minus for particle 1 and 2 plus and 2 minus for particle 2. So we have to sum, for instance, probability of obtaining S x equal 1 over 2 is the sum of the square of the coefficients of this term and this term. Eh? 1 over 4 plus 1 over 4, 1 over 2. Eh? And the same for any other component, any other x component. And the probability of obtaining 1 over 4, since we have 2, 1 pp and 1 mm, these two terms, when we apply the, this operator, should give 1 over 4. So the probability again is 1 fourth plus 1 fourth 1 over 2. And the probability of obtaining the negative value again is one over uh, is one over two. So in this state, we have no information about Sx, nor about the relative values of Sx. The information is only in the z component. Uh, if we study as why we should obtain exactly the same results. Mm -hmm. So in a triplet state, we can say the, that the spins are parallel. But depending on the state we are choosing, the parallelism is manifest, is evident in one axis or in other axes. OK? <coughs> Well, and of course, same thing for the mixed state, eh? because uh, here, <coughs> uh, both in the singlet and the zero component of the triplet, the Sx were completely indeterminate, and the product of them was... Uh, no, again, the error, the mistake in the previous slide affects this result. Because let me see, uh, here, this state and this state have different eigenvalues for the joint observable as x1 times Sx2, 
And so I think this conclusion is no longer valid. Eh? So let me review this eh? because here uh, this is in this state we have this these values are the uh, this this product is not determinate in this mixture state. Yeah? I think this is wrong. Well, uh, you can review this, yeah? and I will do the same, and we talk, we comment in the next class. Okay. Well, I think that's all. The work. No more exercises. No. So let's uh, let's go to the to finish talking about representations. Let me see. Stop sharing. <clears throat> talking about representations, matrix representations of states and operators um, by using uh, the numerable basis set. Uh, we saw that to diagonalize an operator or a matrix is equivalent to finding the eigenvalues, as you probably know. Well, this is a very simple exercise. I talk about it later on. Uh, well, let's uh, see how to define functions of matrices. We have seen how to define the function of an operator. Uh, this was one of the ways of defining the function of an operator by using the Taylor expansion of the operator. Since we know how to calculate this, we can calculate this. Okay. What happens with the corresponding matrices? Huh? How can we relate the matrix of A with the matrix of F of A? Hmm? Well, we are going to see that the same relationship holds for the corresponding matrices. Huh? I'm going to check it for the simple case of an orthonormal basis set. So both types of representations are equivalent. And so I calculate a matrix element of the function operator. And this is a couple of elements of any orthonormal basis set, discrete basis set. We apply here, we take here the scalar product of this. We take out the sum and the f, and we are here we obtain the corresponding matrix element of A to K. Then what I've done here is to, here I have A times A times A. And so I introduce here the identity operator. This is the identity operator. Same thing here, same thing here. As many identity operators with different dummy indexes in every couple of A's. And then we see that this is the IJ component of the product of A, the matrix A elevated to K. Hmm? You know, I don't know if I mentioned it before, uh, in order to calculate an element of a product of matrices, the trick to remember, eh, if I want to calculate, for instance, A, B, element I, J, this is sum over k of, well, those are matrices, eh? 
of um, A, I, K, B, K, J. So the, the mnemotechnic rule I use <laughs> is you have to insert between the two indexes a new index and sum over this new index. So it's a, a way to remember how to put an element of a product of matrices in terms of the individual elements of the multiplied matrices. And the same if we have, instead of two, if we have n factors, then we can insert an index between, eh, so to obtain the ij element of a to k, we have to insert uh, a sum and then i l and uh, l ah. Can't. difficult to write with this well the idea is that to expand ah, let me see to expand to obtain the ij element of this product we have to insert between any couple of A's to insert a new index and a new sum. So we have, this is the first matrix. We insert index, this is A, I, L, and this is A, L, M. Something here, so, and at the end, we obtain A, P, J. And we have to sum. Oui? Let me. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I am using the, the tools that you cannot see. Ah, wait, wait for a moment. Sorry. The, Ah, okay. So, to calculate the IJ element of A to K, we have to write I L L say M and sum over L. Then here M, N, M, N, and sum over N. And at the end, uh, P, J, and sum over P, which is exactly what we have here. So this is this is the result we have obtained and this is how functions of matrices are defined. The function of a matrix A is defined by Taylor expanding the by using the same Taylor expansion as for ordinary functions, but here we have powers of the matrix instead of powers of the, say, the real variable. And so this is, this is the IJ element of matrix FA defined that way. Okay? Well, uh, let me try to erase. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, some trivial consequences. For instance, if we take the conjugate the, of this matrix, we have to take the conjugate of every term. 
the conjugate of A to K, the conjugate of a product of matrices, is the product of the conjugates written in the reverse order. But since all of them are the same, it's the conjugate to power K. And the conjugate of a scalar is the, well, not the conjugate, the adjoint of a scalar is the complex conjugate. And so we see that if the function is real, then the function of a Hermitian matrix is also an Hermitian matrix. Yeah? So for instance, if, say, H is an Hermitian matrix, and so this operator, no, mm -hmm. this operator, which was the density operator at equilibrium, is also an Hermitian matrix. But this operator is not an Hermitian matrix. In fact, this is the time evolution operator, which is unitary, but in general non-Hermitian, because this is not a real function. As a function of x, eh, a to minus i x is not a real function, so the, this does not, uh, this conjugate um, gives a different result eh, for the adjoint and for the original matrix. Eh? So, real function of Hermitian matrices are also Hermitian. Well, this way of calculating functions of matrices uh, is not very practical in some cases because normally these uh, expansions are not uh, quickly convergent. And so, in practice, when we want to calculate functions of matrices, we use some tricks. Huh? One very useful, well, here, sorry, let's go back. Here I have put some, some libraries in Python language in which you have routines for calculating the exponential of, an, of a matrix. And uh, as you have seen, exponential functions are the most common functions that appear in quantum mechanics. Eh? So if we have um, a routine for calculating exponentials of matrices, it's a very practical way of obtaining exponential and of course of obtaining also trigonometric and hyperbolic functions because all of them can be put in terms of exponentials. But in general, if we want to calculate a function of a matrix uh, by using a numerical procedure, the, the most practical way normally is to first diagonalize the matrix to calculate the function and then to go back to the original basis. Why? Let's see. We have to calculate f of a from a. Then first we diagonalize A. We look for a change of basis L that transform A to a diagonal form. And then we apply the definition of the function as a, as a Taylor expansion. And here we include in every couple of factors of A, we include L minus 1 times L, which is, of course, the identity operator. We put the identity operator here, 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 and here. And then, sorry, sorry, <laughs> no, sorry. No, here, what I have done is to substitute this here. 1, 2, 3, and times, k, k times. Yeah? And then I have used this to multiply this by the following L is the unity matrix, same for any couple of Ls. And then at the end, 
the only surviving errors are the first and the last one that can, that can be written outside the sum. And this sum is, of course, the Taylor expansion of the function of the diagonal matrix A. So we can, if we know how to calculate this, it's very easy to calculate this. But as we will see, to calculate, of, to calculate a function of a diagonal matrix is a very simple question. Why? First, let's calculate the ij element of a square, where a is diagonal. Well, this is, we use the same trick I tell before, I introduce l here, sum over l, so is the product of i or a i l a l j. But if the matrix is diagonal, this term is a diagonal element times a Kronecker delta, and the same for the other term. And in this sum, the only survival term corresponds to l equal i and l equal j. So i and j must be equal, and of course then this is a square. So we see that the, to, to take the square of a diagonal matrix, we only have to take the square, well, the square or any power eh, of, of the matrix, because this, this reasoning can be applied as many times as, as we like. So for the square, the square of the diagonal matrix is again a diagonal matrix whose elements are the squares, and the k power of a diagonal matrix is again a diagonal matrix whose elements are the k powers of the diagonal elements. And so then if we want to calculate a function of a diagonal matrix, we see that the ij element of this matrix is this, as we have seen here, and then the delta can go outside the sum, and this is the ordinary function of the eigenvalue. This is nothing but the function of a real number. Here we have no operators, we have only eigenvalues. And so, to calculate any element of a diagonal matrix, the result is a diagonal matrix, and for the diagonal elements, we have to take the functions of the corresponding eigenvalues. And so, a very practical and simple way of obtaining from A, F of F any function of A is first we diagonalize, then, then we calculate the function of the diagonal elements, and finally we make the inverse transformation L minus 1 to go back to the original basis set. Well, of course, for diagonalizing matrices, we have a lot of routines in Fortran, in Python, etc., that can be used to calculate any, any function. Okay? <clears throat> well, mm, let's say a couple of words of methods for orthogonalizing basis sets. Huh? The typical method that is in any mathematic books is the Smith method, eh? which is, the idea is very simple. Eh? For instance, we have here the first basis element, say he one, and the second, for instance, could be this one. First thing, we take the first one and normalize it by dividing by the square, the square root of the product by itself, 
and then we obtain a vector of length 1. Then, we take the second vector and we subtract its projection onto the first one. The projection onto the first one has this length, the scalar product, multiplied by the normalized vector x. And this is the primes of the new basis elements. So the second basis element is obtained by subtracting let me change the color. Um, then here to x2, I subtract this, and the result is this. Yeah? The sum of the two yellow vectors, of course, is x2. So x2 minus the horizontal vector gives the vertical vector. Then we normalize the vertical vector. And we obtain a second vector, x2 prime, this is x1 prime, which is orthogonal to the first one and uh, normalized. And same thing, for instance, for the third vector, we take out, we subtract the projection onto the first and the second, and we normalize the result. And then, for instance, if these were the two first vectors, then we obtain a third vector which is orthogonal to them, etc., etc. Hmm? Well, this is a very simple method, but a very asymmetric method because the first vector is untouched. We only change its length. The direction is untouched. The second one it changes a little. The third one changes somewhat more. And the last vector has nothing to do to the original vector. Yeah? And so, since this will be applied, for instance, if we want to change an uh, atomic basis set to an uh, orthogonal basis set, which has the a close similarity with the original basis set, by making the less mixture with other elements, then in quantum mechanics is normally more useful to, su to, to look for methods which are more symmetric uh, that affect in a similar way to every element. Yeah? One of them is the Lefting method, and I will stop here. In the Lefting method, well, the question is that f uh, to obtain an, an, uh, an orthonormal basis set, we have to change a basis set with a given overlap matrix to a new basis set having as overlap matrix the identity matrix. Because we know that for orthonormal basis set, the overlap matrix should be the identity. And the question is that we will apply a change of basis set and the uh, scalar product representation of the unity in the old basis set was S, and in the new basis set, by applying the transformation that we know that applies for this type of representation, we should change S to 1. So, how can we choose this L? Levdin proposed to take s to minus one half. We know how to calculate the functions of matrices, so we can calculate this function of s. And then we multiply s by l and by l adjoint. Hmm? But this is a real function of an Hermitian matrix, s is an Hermitian matrix, and so S to minus one half should also be an Hermitian matrix, and so we can forget about the dagger sign, and then we have S minus one half, S, S minus one half. Of course, S can be put as S one half times S one half. This times this is unity, 
this times this is unity. Yeah? So this is a simple way and also a symmetric way of um, orthonormalizing a basis set. Mm -hmm. Well, let's stop here and next day we will see an even better way of do this that is very interesting in quantum chemical applications. Any question? Okay, so let's leave it here. Bye. Uh.